Welcome to Hillcrest. We are glad that you are taking the opportunity to view our latest video sermon. Our pastors are proud to offer another way for you to join with the church family in worship each Sunday. Please remember that live services are held at 8.45 a.m. and 11 a.m. every Sunday at Hillcrest on the corner of Halleck and Newland in Jamestown, New York. Now please enjoy today's sermon. Well, I invite you to take a Bible, please, and join me in the New Testament at Luke chapter 19. There are Bibles in each of your rows. If you need a Bible, take one out, page 743 in the church Bibles, Luke chapter 19. And you should have also already received an outline in your bulletin. Pull that on out. You know, I don't know about you, but apart from losing an hour's sleep, I really like the spring forward deal because I know that spring is just around the corner. And, you know, I'll just exercise a little prophetic gift here, okay? That uh, it's not going to be that long, really, before uh, the, the trees will be blossoming and the flowers will be blooming, right? And our shovels and our snow blowers and the plows will all be put away and we'll be mowing our yards and pulling weeds again, all right? Just, just saying, it's just around the corner. And you know, apart, apart from the celebration we're going to be doing next, next month, right? Celebrating the Lord's resurrection. My second favorite thing I look forward to in the spring is Memorial Day. I, I love Memorial Day. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I think it's just terrific that so many of our communities still have Memorial Day parades, right? With the with the high school bands leading the charge and playing, playing all kinds of good music and our military vets uh, parading behind them. And then we've got the community groups and, and usually there's, you know, they're right down the, through the center of town and the big shots, you know, right in the, the back of the, the convertibles and they head to the cemetery and we're all behind. Now we live out in Randolph, and that's how it works here and there. And I'm assuming in many communities it's the same way. Danielle and I wouldn't ever think of missing a Memorial Day Parade. We just, we love it. It's, to me, one of the real cool things about small town America, and I think it's great. Everybody loves a parade. And that's the title of the message today. Everybody loves a parade. And you know, Dr. Luke records perhaps the most famous parade in human history, right here in Luke chapter 19. And it's, it's Jesus' parade from Jericho to Jerusalem. And so, we're heading into now the second half of our series, our Hashtag Jesus series, and we're, we're going to be building to a grand finale. The final, we are into the final week of Jesus' personal, physical ministry on earth. And it's interesting, you know, that all four Gospels uh, record what we're going to look at today. And, and yeah, if you put all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all together, did you know that all four Gospels, you put them all together, there are only four chapters about Jesus' life for the first 30 years. In fact, most of that is about Jesus' birth, his miraculous birth, right? Just a few details about his early childhood, not much up until age 30. But then you put all those four Gospels together, there are 85 chapters that deal with the last three and a half years of Jesus' earthly life. And of those 85 chapters, 29 cover the last week. And of those 29, 13 cover the, specifically the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. So we've been clipping along at a pretty good pace, moving through, through Luke. And some of you say, oh, I can hardly keep up. I just, it's, you're just moving too fast. Well, guess what? We're going to slow it down and we're going to take a deep dive over the next eight weeks into these last five chapters of Luke's gospel. We don't want to miss anything. And so our text today is an entire chapter, Luke chapter 19. You say, oh boy. He's got a whole chapter. We're going to be here till 2 p.m. Yeah, well, not quite, but it's, we're going to need to move along. This is Jesus, again, Jesus' journey, his parade from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now I want to show you a map again. Let's get our bearings. Hopefully some of you are beginning to get a little sense of the geography. So in the north is where Jesus has been around the Sea of, anybody? Galilee, right in the Galilee region, he's been crisscrossing the Sea of Galilee on boat and foot and all the rest, teaching in synagogues and towns and villages everywhere, Luke has been telling us. But he's been working his way down now, down the Jordan River, and here's Jericho. And from Jericho to Jerusalem is about 14, 15 miles, something like that. And it, it's, it's, it's quite a hike. I mean, a good, you know, a person in good shape, it'd be an eight to nine hour walk. Uh, and I'll just show you a couple pictures here. Uh, it's, it's desert. Not a whole lot of trees you see out there. And Israel this time of the year, that's what we're talking about, right? This time of the year in that area, it, probably 80, 
90 degrees, uh, and so not a whole lot of shade. The Romans, interestingly, built a road from Jericho to Jerusalem, and parts of that road still exist today. In fact, there are a couple of bridges 2,000 years later that still exist. Now, why is that? How, how can, our bridges can't last five years, it seems like, but that's another topic for another time. But uh, there's, a, there's a piece of the Roman road that exists still to this day from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now, it's an uphill climb from Jericho to Jerusalem. Get this. The elevation at Jericho is 720 feet below sea level. It's known as the lowest place on the planet, in Jericho. And you climb to the Mount of Olives, that's where we're headed today, to the Mount of Olives. Some of you traveling to Israel, we're going there, we're going there. It's, it's about a 2,700 high uh, mount there. So the climb is about 3,400 feet, okay, from Jericho to Jerusalem. And this time of the year, again, it's, it's hot. So it's not, not a, uh, a, um, it's not a journey for the faint of heart. Let's go to, the, I have a really cool illustration that just shows this. And, and so here it is. Here's Jericho. This is sea level. Okay, everybody? Sea level. And here's Jericho, way down here, 720 feet below sea level. And this is the climb of various places along the way and so on, till you get to the Mount of Olives. And Jerusalem is just a little bit lower than that. That valley there, we're going to talk about that today extensively. Uh, that's the Kidron Valley. And again, those of you who are going, you're going to see it. You're going to see it. And uh, it's, it's a fascinating place. So there's a little bit of background. All right. Luke shows us this morning uh, four things that we're going to highlight. And the parade begins, as we said, in, in Jericho. And he's going to show us, number one, the theme for the parade is Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Now, that isn't a new theme, right? You read the Gospels, you can't help but miss that over and over and over. We, we see, right, that Jesus didn't for people who thought they had it all together, who didn't need to repent, that didn't need a Savior. No, Jesus came for those who were lost, to seek and to save the lost. So look with me, please. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. No, it doesn't say that. We'll get, we'll get to that. Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Anybody want to guess what Zacchaeus' name really means? <laughs> Get this. Zacchaeus means honorable, pure, and righteous. <laughs> I am pretty sure that the people of Jericho didn't see him that way. Because Luke says he's not only a tax collector, but he's a chief tax collector in Jericho, tax collectors, oh boy, Judea tax collectors, right up there, right up there with murderers and robbers. This was the scum of the earth in terms of the Jewish view of them. Jew, these were Jews that were conscripted by the Romans to, to enforce their tax law. They, they were seen as traitors to the Jews. The Jews absolutely hated tax collectors, and for that reason, the religious leaders barred them from the temple. No tax collector could make it in the temple. And, and they couldn't go to the synagogues either. No way. No way. They, they were the scum of the earth. And as we said, right, as Luke says, Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. That means he ruled an area. He was, he was wealthy. This guy was loaded, okay? But he was loaded with other people's money. And so he oversaw the collecting of taxes from that whole region around Jericho, around the, the Jordan River Valley. And people paid a lot of taxes. I mean, we whine and complain about taxes today. And, you know, nobody wants to pay any more taxes than they have to. But these people, I mean, they, they, the Romans hosed them. They, did you know there was something they started with called a poll tax? Meaning, basically, if you were alive, if you were living and breathing a male from 14 to 65, you paid a poll tax every year. Ladies, uh, 12 to 65, I don't know why the two extra years, but you got two extra years of, of taxes. And then there was a flat income tax of 10%, and there were import taxes if you got anything from outside the area. There were road taxes and harbor taxes and fish, fishing taxes. If you were, a, sea, if you were a, a fisherman around the Sea of Galilee, right, and you had fish that came in, every fish you caught was taxed. No joke. No joke, there was a 20% um, a wine tax, a 10% grain tax, and a cart tax. Get this, cart tax. You were taxed on every wheel. So you had four carts, you paid four times the person with the wheelbarrow. I'm guessing there, there were a lot of wheelbarrows that, that day. You'd save 75% right there. So, so Zacchaeus in is in charge of collecting all the taxes from this whole region. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 3. 
He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. He can't see over him. Verse 4, so he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Historians tell us that the average height of a male 2,000 years ago was, anybody? Five feet, about five feet. I'm telling you, what, I was born in the wrong century, right? I, I would I'd be like a, a giant, right, if, if I had been born 2,000 years ago. So he's a short man. The average is five feet, okay, I'm 5'9", five, five, say five feet, right? So a short man, what is he, like four feet high? I mean, seriously, <laughs> my goodness. Now, I'm not laughing at anybody, okay, nobody that's like height challenge. I'm not laughing at you, okay? <laughs> I heard you laughing, I'm laughing with you, all right? So don't send me notes and don't take... The pastor picked on me in church today. and I'm not coming back. He's such a mean guy. <clears throat> All right, verse 5. When Jesus reached that spot, he looked up where, where Zacchaeus was. He looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter. He has gone to, the, to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I, here now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. Now that is a big deal. It's interesting. I love how the Lord orchestrates these things. It's just amazing to me. Guess where I was? I was in the book of Numbers this past week in my, in my reading. I'm making my way through the, the Bible again this year. And, and in my reading in Numbers, I, I saw there again that the Old Testament law prescribed like this. So if you had stolen somebody and you owned up to it, right? You, you, you admitted your guilt voluntarily. If that was the case, the requirement was you had to pay back what you had stolen plus 20%. Then you had to go make a sacrifice. Okay, so what you stole, plus 20%. But what is Zacchaeus saying he's willing to pay back? 400%, right, okay? Four times what he had taken from them. So Now, this, this isn't a guy that's trying to impress Jesus or to earn his salvation. No, this is a guy who has, been, who has experienced the love of Christ and is responding with radical repentance. That's what we've got going on here. You know, the book of James says that faith without works is what? is dead, right? And so here's a man who has living faith and it's demonstrated by his work, by what he does, by, by his repentance. And what's Jesus' response? Verse nine, Jesus said to him, today, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Hmm. Hear that, feel that, feel that embrace. For the son of man, here we go. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. There it is. There's the theme of the parade right there. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 11, while they were still listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. There's another one. Because he was near Jerusalem and all the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So here we go. Je Jesus is again reminding the people that it's not going to be like, like they're thinking it's going to be. The, the Jews, many of them, a lot of Jews were thinking, you know, okay, if Jesus is the Messiah, then that means it's not going to be long before the Romans are going to be thrown out. He's going to be in charge, which means we're going to be calling the shots again. And Jesus knew that. He knew that's what they were thinking. So he wants to make it very clear again that ain't, that ain't going to happen, all right? And it's, he's been telling them this. If you're reading the gospel, you've been seeing it, right? He's been hinting and, and telling them. They haven't been listening, but he's been telling them. So when he arrives in Jerusalem, he's going to die. He's going to be killed. And it won't be until his second coming that he's going to ultimately rule and reign. So he tells them a parable. Here we go, verse 12. We're just going to read it through. He said, Jesus said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. And then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. Verse 16. 
The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, good servant, his master replied. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second man came, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? And then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he, he has, already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to one, everyone who has more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But for those enemies of mine who do not want me to be the king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Wow. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's quite a parable. And there has been a debate since the day Jesus spoke this parable about the meaning of it. What does this parable mean? Who is he talking to? What's he talking about? Now, if you're reading along an N.T. Wright's book, I read it, uh, I recommend it, uh, Look for Everyone, still available at the information station. You know, the N.T. Wright believes that Jesus was speaking to Jewish people back then about their faithfulness and their unfaithfulness, you know, about their faithfulness up to the point when he had arrived, he was returning to this, he was coming to the city and so on. He believes he, he was talking to Jews at, the day, at that day. Could be, could be, could be. And he writes a whole lot smarter than I am. However, I, I also believe that Jesus was speaking about his coming to Jerusalem and, and announcing that there would be rewards for, in the future for the faithful. About those who have yet to hear the gospel and, and who would embrace the gospel and then would, would share the gospel. The, go, the gospel, right? The, the good news of forgiveness in, in Jesus, which the they're going to see the reality of just five days from the time he's telling this parable. The, the victory, the power over sin and death and hell, which one week from this time that he's telling this parable, they would experience that message. Those, those who would take their ten minas, right? And, and if you have a study Bible, you probably have a note that says ten minas, that's roughly equivalent to three, three days wages. So, Every, and everybody receives the same amount. Did you catch that? Everybody receives the same amount. And so I believe what Jesus is saying, he's saying everybody receives the same gospel. Everybody has the same message invested in their lives and the opportunity then to invest that in the lives of the others. But there are also some who, who will hear the gospel and do nothing with it. They wrap it up and they put it away and, and, and they think they belong to Jesus. They would say that they are servants of his, but they're really playing games is what they're doing. They nod their heads and, and they sing the songs. They go through the motions, but they really don't embrace the gospel and they have no, no interest in investing that in the lives of others. And Jesus is saying when he returns, it's all going to be exposed and the truth will be revealed and judgment is going to fall on the faithless. I think that's exactly what he's saying. It, this, I mean, this is a sobering parable, but it's in complete alignment with what Jesus has been teaching for three years, right? Jesus said, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, right, is, is going to enter the kingdom, but only he or she who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus' words. Okay, so the parade continues then after the parable, verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. Okay, I can't resist. I got to show you a couple more pictures. <clears throat> the Mount of Olives is just across from the valley, the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem. And so this is taken looking back from Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley, down below here, it's a long valley, and up to the Mount of Olives. 
and this is, these are olive trees, and there's a big olive gro a grove there, and there's a garden. Anybody know what garden that might be? That would be the Garden of Gethsemane. That's right. And so, so Jesus has come from, from behind, uh, from Jericho, and he's come to, to this ridge, and now he's looking over to where this picture is taken. And, and I have a, a short video, I think, that will just let that play as I'm describing the scene. In fact, just, just watch this as, this is one I took, and just listen. So uh, Jesus climbed to the top of the Mount of Olives, and he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go then to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, what are you, why are you untying this? Uh, tell him the Lord needs it. Now, that's just kind of a weird deal, isn't it? That, that's, that's kind of a weird thing when you, when you just read that. But, you know, the disciples have learned not to question Jesus. Remember, remember back a few weeks ago, the time when, when, when Jesus uh, said to Peter, he, he's a fisherman, right? He's fishing buddies. they just gotten in from fishing all night long, caught nothing. And, and so Jesus says, well, why don't you take your note and go out, or your net and, and go out into the deep water and throw it in? Oh, I never thought of that. You know, that's how I'm reading it. Right? Oh, okay. And then Jesus is like, oh, just trust me. Trust me on this. So they do it. And the catch is so big, they have to bring out another boat. And in fact, it's so big, it's sinking both of them, you know, practically to get it into shore. Remember, there's another time they owe taxes, right? Taxes are due. And so uh, Jesus tells uh, Peter, he says, I want you to go out and do some fishing. And the first fish you catch, I want you to open his mouth. And inside will be a coin and it'll be enough to pay the taxes. So they've learned not to question Jesus. Right? They, they, so they tell him to go get a donkey. And here we go. Uh, verse 32. So those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. Surprise, surprise. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Now, that, that may not sound very impressive. That, it doesn't sound like much of a float. I mean, it's not like riding in the back of a you know, Ferrari convertible. Or, do they have Ferrari convertibles? I don't know. But it's not quite the same, right? You're thinking, uh, riding on a donkey. I, I don't see where that would be all that impressive for the king, the Messiah, to enter into Jerusalem. But, but what we all need to understand is Jesus' entrance, riding on a donkey, is fulfilling prophecy. More prophecy. Over 500 years prior to this day, the prophet Zechariah, listen, he wrote this concerning the Messiah, or the coming Messiah. He said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Is that, is that today? All right. So you want to know more? You go to Dan Key's Sunday School class today. He'll take you deeper. So notice, though, Jesus is not entering, in other words, on top of Sherman Tank, right, as a conqueror. He's not entering as a conqueror. He's entering as a humble king. That's the picture. And it's interesting, you know, back in 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, Solomon sat on King David's donkey as he was going to be anointed as king over Israel. So to be presented on a donkey entering the gates of Jerusalem meant he was being anointed as Israel's king. And I'll tell you what, this is not lost on the religious big shots. They get it. They get exactly what's going on. So I'll show you another picture. Jesus is riding a donkey now and he's headed from that spot that we saw looking at Jerusalem. And he's, he's coming up to what's called the Eastern Gate. It's also called the Golden Gate. This, this is a gate right here. This is the gate. It's actually a gate that was built about 500 years after the time of Jesus on top of, because <laughs> Jerusalem was leveled, right? We'll get to that in a minute. So they rebuilt this gate and uh, um, about 500 years later, this is also called the Eastern Gate or the Gate Beautiful. Now, what, what do you notice about this gate? Anybody? What do, what do you notice about it? Pardon me? 
Uh, yeah, no doors. Uh, that, that thing is sealed shut. So in the 1500s, the Muslims invaded the Ottoman Empire, and they sealed that thing. Because prophecy says, guess where Jesus is coming from and where he's entering Jerusalem? Through the Eastern Gate. They wanted to make sure that wasn't going to happen. Interesting. So it remains sealed to this day. Now, during Passover, the, the city of Jerusalem, historians tell us that the population was probably about 250,000. Not, not a small city, pretty good sized city. But during Passover, during that celebration, the, the, the uh, population would swell to almost 3 million Jews that would flock to the city for Passover. Let's, so let's keep going. Here we go. You got the picture? Verse 37 now. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, he's going down into the Kindred Valley, the whole crowd of disciples, the whole crowd, the whole parade began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. See, they, they get what's going on here. They understand what's being saying, right? The, the, the people are welcoming Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah. And they're having a fit about it. So what does Jesus say to the Pharisees? Verse 40, he says, I tell you. He replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. The view from, from the Mount of Olives down the path, the road, through the Kidron Valley to Jerusalem is spectacular. It is breathtaking. And so I want you to think about that now as we read verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, wept. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but it is now hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. What's he talking about? He's prophesying. He's, he's weeping over the coming destruction of Jerusalem. In AD 70, the Romans came in and they leveled the city. They destroyed the temple. In fact, this picture here in this window is what's remaining from Herod's temple. It's, it's the Western Wailing Wall. We'll get some better light on it next week. I encourage you to come up and take a, take a peek at that at some point. But that's about all that's left of the temple area after the Romans got done with it. They would level the city. They would destroy the temple. And Jesus just weeps as he knows what's coming. This, this is the last time he will enter the, whole, the holy city before he goes to the cross. And he says, if you'd known, if you'd only known who was coming today and that would bring you peace, hmm, but you would have none of it. You'd have none of it. And it's, it's hidden from your eyes and soul because of your unbelief. There will be total destruction for this city because you have completely missed the time of God's coming to you. Verse 45. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So no sooner has he entered the city of Jerusalem, he goes to the temple and he begins cleaning house. Worship has become corrupted. He knows it and he's seen it in the past. And, and nowhere is it more obvious than what is going on in the temple. You know, the high priest and his family, they, they, they set themselves up. They had, they, had, they had money changing booths, tables, and so on. So the foreigners that would come for Passover had to exchange their money in order to, to buy the sacrifices, which they also sold. So they were, they were selling sacrifices to the foreigners that were coming in the pilgrims that were coming in for Passover and getting rich off of it. And Jesus just 
goes crazy. If you read the other gospel accounts, you get a picture of Jesus just chipping over the tables and throwing people out of the temple area. Verse 47. Every day he was teaching at the temple. But the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. So now, get this, get it, right? Now it's affecting their wallets. So it's getting really serious. Now it's impacting their money. So this, this can't stand. This, this something has to change. So they're looking for a way to try and kill him. Verse 48. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. <laughs> and that is as far as we're going to go in Luke chapter 19 today because now it's time to ask our most important question. Um, so, it's a question, right? We say we should ask every time we open the book here throughout the week. All right? So take a deep breath. Say it with me. Ready? One, two, three. So what? Right. A lot going on here, chapter 19, you're thinking. But what does donkeys and parades and Mount of Olives and tipping over tables have to do with us? What difference does this make, really, for our lives? I, I believe there are several applications. And I'm just going to leave the Holy Spirit to make a, a bunch in your heart. I'm trusting that he already has by his power of his word, right? But I want to focus on one this morning as we bring this to a close. Do you understand that we are entering into a key season of the year? We are entering into it, and, and it's important, just, just as people then, 2,000 years ago, it's important for us today that we don't miss it, that we just don't totally miss the time that's before us. I, I don't think I'm overstating it one bit. You know, those of you who know, know the Lord, right? right? People are open at this time of the year, in, in ways that they aren't open perhaps at any other time of the year. And, and those of you who are deacons, those of you who serve on the CE board, those of you who are part of the finance team and the trustees and the missions team, those of you who are staff know that for much of the last year we've been talking about how do we create more of a culture of evangelism within this family, right? And we've been praying to that. If you've been around here for any length of time, you're hearing that recurring theme. We are coming into a key season when the gospel needs to be shared, right? Six weeks from today is Easter Sunday, our celebration of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And I tell you again, people are open. I'm believing in faith that people are open at this time of the year to receiving and experiencing the love of Christ where they might not be other times of the year. So I want to challenge you in three ways to take this seriously. To take seriously the theme of what we've read, that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. The first way is prayerfully. I want to challenge you to share Jesus prayerfully. You know, God moves mountains when we pray. That's not just cliche. That's not just religious mumbo jumbo, right? That's, that's truth. He can break hearts of stone. He can open doors of conversation. Some of you have experienced that in your own life. You're coming to faith. Proves this fact, right? The Holy Spirit is the one who removes the blinders, who opens the ears, who opens the hearts to receive and respond. So let me ask you this. Who are you praying for? Who are you going to pray for the next six weeks that they would come to know Jesus? And I want to strongly encourage you to have at least one person, if not a couple or a family or several. So pray, uh, share Jesus, number one, prayerfully. Number two, creatively. Creatively. Ask God how he would, ask, he would lead you to, to share the gospel. And you know what? Some of you are far more creative than I'll ever be, right? But I'll tell you what, I am really fired up about what we're doing, the new thing we're doing at Easter this year. We're doing, doing Holy Week. In your bulletin, it's this card, and I'm going to ask you to just pull it out. Probably looked at it already. Um, there's, there's a drama, there's a dinner, and it's a really good dinner. Um, I've seen the menu already. You can go online and, and check it out. It's a really good dinner. Did you know, I went to McDonald's the other day and ordered one of the value meals. It was like 12 bucks, $8, dinner and dessert. And it, it, this isn't a TV dinner or anything. This isn't a Big Mac, all right? This, this is good stuff. You're, you're going to like it. But it's more than a dinner, and it's more than a drama. We've been working on this script for two years. 
no joke. Um, last year's sermon series, the Portraits of the Passion, was the, the foundation of a lot of what we're doing. So you're going to hear testimonials from Thomas and Rabbi Nicodemus and Rabbi um, Joseph of Arimathea and Mary Magdalene and others of how Jesus has changed their lives and how the hope of the resurrection changes everything, right? It's all about the, the 40 days after Easter. It's just water. It's okay. <laughs> Share Jesus prayerfully, creatively, and third, boldly. This morning, this morning, again, only the Lord could orchestrate these. You know, it's just amazing. So I'm reading in Ephesians 6, and uh, the, the prayer as Paul is uh, closing the book of Ephesians is he's asking the Ephesians to pray that he would be more bold in his sharing the gospel. <laughs> no kidding. You know, I think Apostle Paul was being pretty bold. Uh, pretty fearless, right? But maybe the, the greatest missionary the church has ever known. And, and if he need, needed more boldness, I'm guessing you and I need some also. So I want to encourage you, right, to be bold, to take the risk, to do the ask. So, so what about the guy you work with? What about the ladies in your office? What about the student in your classroom, right? What, what about the receptionists at the doctor's office or the clerk at Aldi's or Wegmans? What about the family that has kids, you know, the same age as your, your family has? What about the neighbors that moved in down the street? What about the cousin who lives down around the road that doesn't know Jesus? What about these people? It's time I'm telling you what. It's time for you to do an ask. And, and what I'm going to say to you is, I'm going to encourage you not to just make a reservation for yourself or yourself and your wife or your spouse, right? But to make a, make a reservation for another couple or another person in faith and invite them to Jesus in the 40 days. And I promise you this, we will share the gospel clearly and clear, creatively and there'll be an opportunity for them to respond. This is a key time. This is a key time and we don't want to miss it. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes, our eyes, and our ears, our minds, our memories, to, to think of the people that are on your heart, that you've already planted seeds, and that are ready for the harvest, ready to come home, ready to find a real saving faith in Christ. And Lord, that you would open conversation and doors of opportunity for us to share prayerfully, creatively, and boldly. That we would see a harvest, so we'd see many come to know you, Lord Jesus, for who you really are. And we thank you that you are our Lord and our Savior. Thank you for giving us life and hope for eternity. Thank you, too, for speaking to us today through your word. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.